Okay, yeah, so it's my pleasure to introduce Alex Broom. So Alex is from the University of New South Wales, prof there. I think he's probably the leader in sociology and health in the world, I would think. Um, we did our PhD at the same time. And we were both doing prostate cancer. And we were both in Melbourne. And uh, we had a little battle around recruitment. And I think we shared a couple of participants, as the story goes. And, uh, and I followed Alex and watched his progress over the years. So he went to the UK and did a postdoc and then went back to Oz and has been in Queensland and now is back in Sydney. So I'm so delighted to catch up with him all these years later, these 15 years later, and to be working with him on a grant, but also to be able to host him. So welcome, Alex. Looking forward to uh, hearing you talk. Thank you. Do we need to, is the screen all right like that? Or is there a light screen now? But as soon as you start doing things, then I'll bring up again. Excellent. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I reiterate uh, John's comments about um, how fortuitous it is for us to uh, sort of diverge and then re-emerge together in, in, in our academic trajectories. Um, and, um, and I think today is probably uh, a good theme in terms of some of the issues that both of us um, have been researching. Um, and really, I guess what I want to do is explore conceptually and touch on empirically uh, what suffering is, how we might think about it differently. Um, and I think it touches on some key issues for um, people like John and myself, but also those working in, uh, I guess, oncology context, but health and illness more broadly, of what the implications are of how we think about suffering. It might seem self-evident to some people, um, to many people perhaps, uh, what suffering actually is. And I guess I'm here to argue today that it's far from self-evident. Um, but not only that, but the way it's conceptualised and the way it's thought of has implications. Um, and it's a serious issue if we don't understand and think about suffering um, in, uh, in sophisticated ways, this will have blow on effects to how people are cared for and treated um, when they uh, get ill. So, what uh, or where does this all come from? Um, in some respects, what I'm going to talk about today is a sort of a process of emergence for me over the last decade um, in thinking about the lived experience of cancer, often palliative and end-of-life care. Um, and I've been, uh, I guess, working up to um, how we might both think of and operationalise suffering um, in useful and unique ways um, as a result of a lot of the qualitative research that I've been doing. Um, over the course, and as John mentioned at the start of the talk, um, my travels in uh, starting in New Zealand, moving to Australia, um, doing qualitative research in oncology in Britain, then coming back to Australia, and more recently looking at these issues in the context of India as well, um, so non OECD context. Within this, I have been interested in developing um, a sort of a novel conceptualization of suffering, which has sort of emerged in a book that I've written um, with a colleague, and it's um, forthcoming. And I want to outline a series of principles um, today and how we might conceptually think about suffering. Um, and then I'm going to operationalize it to an extent in the context of um, research or my research in cancer and end-of-life care. So the principles um, that I'm going to work through. This is sort of like a, a, a teaser slide. Um, the first one is that suffering is in fact um, an effective assemblage. That will become clearer as I work through, um, I guess, both or drill down to the conceptual framework, but also the empirical material. That as health professionals uh, or carers of any form, for that matter, that actually uh, caring for those or being with those who are suffering actually constitutes suffering in itself or is part of the assemblage of suffering. 
I guess what I'm moving towards, um, and hopefully that's clear um, by the end of today, is to produce a kind of a relational ontology of what suffering is, how it um, is experienced, mediated, and intersubjective. Um, I'm interested in um, care um, as a relational entity rather than as something that one gives or receives. Um, and I think there's good precedent for that. And I think there are important reasons why we need to think about care in those terms. Um, of particular importance is, and I'll explain this in a more detail as we progress through the slides, is that emotions, of which I'm very interested in from a sociological perspective, feelings, light, um, that we collectively, individually and collectively, create certain atmospheres, certain um, uh, ways of thinking and feeling about things which shape what we are and are not prepared or can do within particular contexts. This will become clearer, hopefully, uh, as I start to unpack it. So what do I actually mean um, by a, I guess, suffering as an assemblage? Um, I guess when we start to break down um, and I'll operationalise it in terms of a diagnosis with cancer or living with cancer and seeking care for cancer. But on a more theoretical level, um, the experience of suffering isn't located in the individual. Um, it actually is the product of a whole variety of contributing and often countervailing forces. So we might be talking about uh, a political um, kind of influence, we might be talking about economic influences, um, we're talking about cultural ideas, about resilience, about survival, about hope and willfulness and so on, as well as the stuff that makes us up as individuals that we feel in relation to all those things. So what I'm going to try and, um, I guess, articulate today um, is how, in thinking about suffering, um, we need to avoid uh, or destabilise particular binaries between who is ill and who is well, or who is uh, caring and who is cared for. These binaries often don't really work very well in practice in thinking about suffering. I'll explain or utilise data to illustrate this as well. Now, Mara um, uh, Ahmed has made some uh, interesting reflections on this conceptually, and she says, and I think this is very pertinent, we are moved by things, and in being moved, we make things. Now, the concept there is that emotions aren't just there, they achieve things. And by contributing to an a, a, a emotional atmosphere around, say, a person who's living with cancer, or a person who's um, living with any condition, actually, that, all, that creates certain momentum in certain directions. Um, it's, a, it's part of the image, I guess, of for many people suffering. Now, I have a particular interest in the dynamics of care um, and how that relates to the experience of suffering. Now, a simplistic view of care is that, you know, uh, a person gets ill or sick or is nearing the end of life, as in the case for a lot of my research, and then we care for them. But actually, the situation obviously is much more complex than that. Um, and um, I don't think we can actually think and operationalise suffering unless we think critically and in a nuanced fashion about what constitutes care. Now, I'm talking about, I'm going to hone in on professional care actually, but I'm also talking about care from anyone, a partner, family member, whoever it might be, a stranger, the state. Care is a multi-factorial, intersubjective um, uh, process. So, but within all these relations, and particularly when it's person to person, I think it's important that we don't actually, um, or that we move away from identifying a discrete sufferer. And I'm going to show you why I think this is the case in the oncological context. I think that there isn't a very good 
or discrete carer or cared for subject position. I also think that um, things become blurred in practice um, and um, suffering moves across people um, and I'll sort of unpack what that actually means. And I guess if you want to um, put it in somewhat rhetorical terms, um, care is a somewhat troubled, troubled companion of suffering. I am going to get to the, the empirical side of things at some point, um, but I want to outline some the broader principles don't keep going forever in case anyone was wondering. Um, one of the other facets of, of, I guess, conceptually what I'm interested in is the moral underpinnings of how and why we suffer in the ways we do. Now, um, often, and this will, people will be familiar with, with this, is that there are moral frameworks that permeate, that underpin, that emerge from um, the experience of living with cancer, um, as they do in the context of many other conditions, actually. Um, and they circulate around people, settle on people, one could almost say. Now, I articulate this as, as we do in the book, um, as a moral economy of caring and affliction, because I think caring and affliction operate in dialectical terms. Um, and I guess the broad question that I ask, and we ask in the book, is um, what illness and care require of their subjects um, and how that's integral to how suffering should be conceptualised as a social relation. In some respects, um, I think of this as kind of the moral labour of care um, and uh, I've had quite an interest in informal care, um, particularly at the end of life. Um, over the course of the last few years. Um, that's a really interesting site where family caregivers um, embark on these kind of um, uh, moral trajectories and then find that they have immoral feelings and thoughts and, and it doesn't quite fit with what they imagined that their caring practice would be at the end of life. So when I say the moral labour of care, I don't mean enacting morality, I mean the moral questions and conundrums that are raised for us in attempting to care for another um, and the suffering that may um, emerge from that as the person who is attempting to care. Um, now, as we'll see in the, in the data um, that I'm going to present, what's quite interesting about this kind of moral labour is when it falls down, in inverted commas, when it's not possible, when for whatever reason we aren't able to live up to the virtues of the expectations that we have for ourselves as um, subjects, as professionals, or whatever position we might be in as family members. So we get this emergence of problematic affect or feelings, feeling distance, feeling associated, disengaged, which become accepted as normal because they have to be because that is what is emerging. There's a sort of a normalisation of um, affective responses to illness, affliction, and the end of life, in my context. Um, and I think what emerges is um, a sort of a, a fundamental difficulty in separating um, what we feel, who we are, what we desire, from what that which is circulating around us. Uh, which makes this notion of the sort of affective atmosphere interesting because it doesn't deny that we have our own stuff. What it's saying is that it's, it's up there or in there with a whole range of other things um, and you might consider these to be, for example, taboo around even talking about dying or the end of life. Um, the desire for willfulness, um, that you know, um, a notion of when there's a will, when there's a will, there is a way. It's even a, an erstwhile maxim um, that that pushes us forward. Um, and this is what I would call a kind of a governance of the subject um, that articulates itself as an atmosphere or a feeling around something, 
what I should do, where I should go, how I should do it, and so forth. So, in some respects, this um, or the feelings around something um, are articulate the difficulties that we may have in separating ourselves from others, which we all know operates in any environment. But I don't think it's well articulated in the context of um, giving and receiving care. Um, and you know, psycho, you know, anyone that's sort of interested in psychoanalysis will be uh, quite familiar with these types of sort of notions of um, enmeshment and dissociation and transference and, and so forth. Now, I I would argue that these haven't been that well um, dealt with these types of dynamics in the clinical sphere. Um, perhaps as well as they are in other environments, certainly not in oncology, and they're certainly not operationalised that well in the context that I've worked in. So, um, how, how is this actually articulated in real life? Or death, as it may be. Um, the first case study that I want to, I guess, um, throw out there today, um, there's lots more. I'm only showing you a little bit of data. Um, and there's lots more than this in, in the book and in the other work that I've done. But I want to just provide an example of how suffering is um, uh, not discreetly located with the person who is um, living with cancer, um, that there is actually suffering beyond the biophysical, uh, but also not, not in the normal way we think about that, beyond the individual. Um, and that the existing concepts we have don't well capture these entanglements. Um, one of, I guess, the arguments that I want to make um, is that um, for doctors and nurses in particular, because that's who mainly participated in the work that, um, that I've been doing, um, there are kind of a, erroneous distinctions, such as those that I've already presented um, today, and that we actually would, be, would benefit from a model that looked at sort of the, a relational ontology of being in care rather than offering or receiving it, and how things move across people. Um, and um, that does things for patients, for families, and for health professionals, whether that be hope, dread, and all the other list of the many things that we feel and, and experience um, when uh, diagnosed with cancer. What I think oncology um, encounters could be better conceptualised as is the embodied collective suffering um, or as embodied collective suffering. Um, and I think that as you may or may not agree, this is up for discussion, um, that um, when I show you the narratives of the professionals, some of them that have taken part in my work, um, it starts to question some of these dualities that we assume or some people assume um, within the therapeutic encounter. Um, so let me show you some data and then we can speculate further, further on what might be happening. Um, this is a medical oncologist who took part of one of my uh, studies. It's exhausting, but time heals. So you feel it more emotionally acutely while it's happening and it hurts, it physically hurts. Watching this man who's dying physically hurts me and my nurse. We're in pain physically, because of the emotional strain of watching a person suffer. The very young ones. I've had 30-year-olds or 27-year-olds die. They usually hang out until the last minute, I would say, you know, almost until the last month or so. They don't want to be handed over to the palliative care team. And it's not only them, it's their families. It's still heartbreaking to have to tell them with the mother or the father in the room, that there is just nothing more I can offer them. It's really hard to walk people to the grave and say, OK, jump in. And that's what I think oncologists feel their position is when you have to say, stop now. The ones that I really struggle with are the ones with the young kids. And I've seen the kids a lot. Because, you know, the thing is, a lot of young parents have nowhere to put their babies. And they'll come to the clinic with their pranks. That's just, I mean, that's the kind of thing you actually dread it a few months before it's actually going to happen. 
So oftentimes, if patients get a recurrence, it's a situation where you sort of know in your heart they're likely to succumb to their disease. But often we sort of convince ourselves that we can, you know, fix it. Yeah. And when you're dealing with those patients, you sort of try to be positive, even though you know if it comes back, you sort of know it's not looking too good for them. So you can start to see how the emotions underlying the intersubjective um, context are experienced as, or in embodied ways, um, are experienced in ways, and we're starting to move towards this in the narrative that might shape how they would approach the care of the um, person. And this gives it more explicitly. We will say to patients, we've got something for you. We go, here's a trial, you go on this, or you could go on this. And they, the patient, go, well, this must be good, you know. If it's a trial, it's something fantastic. Even though you could go to great lengths to say, this is not going to cure your lung cancer. People often have unrealistic expectations. Now, I find this an interesting narrative because it really starts off with, we say it because we're a bit desperate and we're feeling it. And then it moves to a slightly problematic representation of an experimental treatment, and then it projects onto the patients. They've got unrealistic expectations. You can see the full circle happening here in terms of the emotional world of the oncologist and how it might have, how I would say, the suffering of the clinician has a flow-on effect in terms of what care is provided to the patient. Or the atmosphere that gets created around the decision making. So there are a lot of oncologists who just don't have the art of being able to communicate dying. I think it's just protecting themselves, maybe. And I said, from what? And she said, well, from the emotions. It's not easy. Like, you can't, you know, you can't go home after having told maybe three people that they have nothing left. Can't go home normal that day. It does affect you. And then you just, you know, you're quite low for, for well, at least the rest of the evening and the night until the next morning. It has to affect you because we're all just human beings. You can't be numb to it. Or at least that's what she said. Others weren't so sure. The people who really care don't last. Because it's too, you know, to actually carry that emotional baggage with you, you're not going to sustain yourself. Another uh, urologist says, you get into a model of pragmatism about pointing out what is and is not possible for them. Relating empathetically with them is about that. Sometimes those are difficult conversations. Sometimes they last longer than you would like. Craig says, I do take the emotion out of it, and it's very factual. I don't know if that's offensive to people. But that's just the way I do it. If you get overly emo involved emotionally, you're not going to give necessarily the best care because your inside or your decision-making is blurred. So you can still feel for people, but at the end of the day, yeah, you're not overly emotionally involved. I stopped going to funerals a long time ago. So it's an, you can see they're all male, by the way. So, I mean, there's an interesting uh, observation. I'm not going to go into the gender dynamics of these things um, today, but uh, as, a, as a sociologist, I thought I would point that out. Um, I, I think that what we can see here is the entanglement of clinicians and the emotions at hand and what is occurring and strategies in order to try and bracket that, reduce it, accept it and so forth. But it is certainly a case that they are not just um, as, you know, has been written about before, that clinicians actually experience things like burnout and compassion fatigue and all those psychosocial notions which have attempted to capture the dynamic. But what they don't capture is the fact that there are interconnections between what people are actually experiencing. So it's not a discrete burnout on the case of the clinician, suffering on the case of the patient. Actually, they are not separate. And they are concurrently um, holding up one another's actual experiences. I mean, emotionally, it can be difficult. And the point of view, that, but by cutting myself off, well, I think that's a bit of a cop-out. And in fact, the point in time when I do that is going to be the time when you're really missing out on something. Because even though it might be emotionally draining, 
If you just stand back and say, well, here you go on your way, that's a problem. I think you're protecting yourself, but in fact you're missing out on something. That's not a very healthy approach to get involved. So you can see how there's kind of a tussle, I guess, with um, managing those kind of difficult emotions. Now, in the context that I'm talking here, um, I feel like I'm, I'm perhaps not spending enough time on, on how um, nurses mediated suffering and emotions. I do have, um, and I have written two papers on this, um, and I'd be happy to send um, them to anyone who's interested on how, um, uh, on the issues that I deal with fairly briefly in these slides, um, but I tease out in, in significant depth. There was, and it will come as no surprise to anyone, um, that um, the nurses who've taken part in the number of studies that I've done around this area um, were much more comfortable with the kind of emotional labour. This is not new. There's been lots written about it in social sciences, lots written about it in nursing. Um, much more capable and or saw themselves as more capable, um, but were also allocated, a, I guess, a specific role in the emotions of suffering and mediating multiple stakeholders' experiences of that, including the doctors. And I want to just, bearing in mind that I, mean, I can see the time is ticking away, I want to show you in particular the, what occurs when um, the nurses are faced with managing this sort of slightly repressive um, techniques of the doctors, or when they're faced with, and, and the implications for care, um, of the lack of acknowledgement that suffering is um, being felt and experienced by the doctors, but also the implications in terms of nurses experiencing that in their everyday work. I'll read you out some quotes. And this is about talking about potential futility in the end of life. So the way it tends to happen around here is the oncologist or the haematologist comes in with very little tact, often, delivers bad news, paints a very grim picture of things, and then says, palliative care will come and see you. So often the first consultation you have with the patient, they're like a deer in the headlights. Oh my God, palliative care are here. I've been told it's all bad news, what's the next step? And you're sort of back paddling. It's presented by the doctor as a choice to the patient, as if you failed, you know? So this is the start of the complex emotions, and I would argue, often of the doctors, that the nurses are having to manage as an outcome of that exchange. I think partly because some doctors don't like talking about death. It's not part of the conversation, but they probably have the comfort to have or the skills to have. That's a much easier conversation. I think sometimes it just comes down to the specialist. Comes down to the specialist just doesn't know how to do it. And it says, it all rings on, it all swings on the physician conversations and how the physicians have communicated with the patients. It can be a whole lot better if the physician is really honest and upfront with the patient. You know, some of them do it beautifully, but some of them don't do it at all because it's a hard conversation to have. And that makes it really hard for nurses. You know, sometimes we've got patients who you know have metastatic disease, absolutely zero chance of survival, and yet we're still doing active treatments. And that sends a really conflicted message to the patient. So it also sends um, very difficult um, uh, uh, atmospheres to the nurse to manage. So what you've got, in my view, is a kind of a circulation of desire, like what we want to happen. And it's quite conflicted, family members, doctors, nurses, patients, all contributing to a particular type of atmosphere, often contested, often with conflictory desires, um, which is part of the dynamic of suffering. Now, I guess one of the messages that I wanted to emphasize today is that clinicians are actually part of the suffering. And this is, I guess, one of the conceptual points that I wanted to make earlier, or did make earlier as well but there are consequences. Um, they're part of it and they offer things to it, um, depending on the clinician, depending on the patient situation. A sense of their own failure in the, in the context of the doctors especially. 
to help or mask the disease, anticipatory grief, loss of the therapeutic alliance. I'm no longer going to be important to the patient. You assume it's just that the patient is having uh, suffering the grief of the loss of uh, the relationship with the doctor, but actually that's often not the case. In fact, they'll be quite, quite pleased to see the back of their oncologist. So you can see here how um, the assumptions we make about who's getting what and what the, the end result is can be quite problematic. So, um, and I, you know, the, the concepts of collusion um, are useful, um, but I don't necessarily capture it all. Now, I think the concealment of emotions has really, really problematic effects. Like, uh, I, you know, one of my desires um, is that we focus on what people are willing to happen. Um, the desires that circulate within um, a collective decision making. Who wants what for what reasons? And it doesn't need to be rational, it just is. And it's part of the process that can lead to suffering or not. In the context of many of the participants in my work, it's to not be able to let go because of the collective effort to maintain willfulness and hope. So that's suffering as a, a, the product of a collective um, kind of will or dynamic. If you're interested in, in some of the work that um, I've drawn on, um, there's a couple of books on the right of the screen, uh, which I think are really useful and really interesting. Um, about the um, dynamics of optimism um, and cruelty and late modernity, uh, but also the, um, the problematic of willfulness, um, but also its, its I guess, um, potential. So, um, uh, another concept that I think is quite um, interesting, and I I'm only going to touch on it briefly, is the fact that um, care can be retracted, whether or not it's acknowledged. That this notion of care as a gift is highly problematic, um, and because often it doesn't, it's not experienced in that way, and that assumes a receiving grateful subject, which is also highly problematic, because that is often not the case either. So. Um, and this relates to suffering as emerging from the person in, in the context of my work who is dying um, versus suffering as emergent from a carer who simply cannot do it, um, who simply cannot face what is occurring for a whole range of reasons. So um, one way of thinking about the, like, the narratives of the oncologists that I put up previously is that there is an underlying grief there um, which reflects or is reflected in the withdrawal of um, compassion and care. This is not judgmental, the way I'm talking about it today. It's merely an observation of what is, is and is not possible um, or what people can and can't offer in the caring relationship. It's not a matter of people are bad or people are good. Otherwise, I will be remoralizing about that situation, which I am definitely not doing. So um, my interest here is um, how we think critically about clinicians' emotions at work, both, both senses of that phrase. Um, the, the problem lies that, and I realize that time is um, ticking on here, so John, do, do tell me when. I need to wind up. Um, there's, there's another section to the talk, so yeah. on patient experiences, so I could. I'm sure there's questions. So maybe you know, if you, what do you think? Maybe like twelve minutes. Sure. Yeah. Well, let me jump to um, some patient um, interviews. So, oh, there you go. Okay, study two. Um, I. One of the other areas that I'm. It's a chapter in the book actually that I'm working on is um, survivorship. Um, and it's sort of an odd partner, you might think, but, but actually it's not. And I'll, I want to, um, it's a good example of how suffering is the product, sorry, 
how suffering can emerge from a relational kind of dynamic. Um, that to suffer in survival can be the product of um, a collective um, atmosphere, a moral economy of actually hope, um, and how there are permissive moral boundaries operating around that. The problem is, and I said it before actually, so it's sort of a slight repeat of that, um, that um, there is often a concealing of the dynamic of survivorship um, as sociality. Um, and what I mean by that is it's, that it's actually a social practice rather than um, something we necessarily wish to or want to do, um, bearing in mind that those two things aren't necessarily exclusive. What you can see in the data that I'll present is that is, survivorship is actually a, a site of resistance and horror, disdain and dread, um, not just hope and resilience and willfulness. So let's skip to it before I get to the end of my time. I can share the slides um, with uh, whoever is interested in reading. <clears throat> Erica, in an interview. Oh, what a chore living. I'd just as soon as die. Sorry, I'd just as soon die. Really? Yep, I'd just as soon die. I'm 85 and there's nothing more. There's really nothing in this life to sort of get excited about. Yeah? But anyway, I don't know. But anyhow, I don't know. It doesn't look as though I'm going to die. Right, carrying on despite your best wishes, whether I like it or not. Yeah? What do you think your husband and daughters would say? Oh, they don't like that at all. Do you tell them how you feel? Yeah. I tell them I feel like dying. And they go, no, you can't do that. And the grandchildren say, no, you can't do that. This is a, an interesting example of suffering in relation, or with relations. A bit more uh, kind of embedded in these. I'm trying to keep a level head, not allow myself to get into any form of depressed state of mind. And yeah, be as positive as possible. I often thought that if you didn't really care about your family, it would be a lot easier on everybody when these sort of things arise. Advanced cancer, he's talking about. I don't talk about the end. He can't cope with that because he feels that if anything happens to me, that's the end of his life as well. So we haven't progressed. We will have to further down the track. But at this point in time, there's no need to because I'm well. I've got an 11 year old son as well. I told him I'm going to get better, which is one of my main drivers of I can't die right now. I can't die yet. We had to talk like that. I couldn't like say, this thing's eating me away, I am going to die, so I didn't. Now, um, I'm going to um, skip over this slide. Actually, no, I won't because I, I, there's a very important point here. I disagree with the Cancer Council, actually. Cancer Council is inclined to want you to go out there, pin your pink lady on your chest and shout to the world, hey, look at me, I have cancer, I have breast cancer. I don't agree with that. I believe you share it with your closest friends and whoever you want to talk to but you don't necessarily go out there and shout it out, shout it to the world. Because the moment you do that, two things happen. You become public property. And the second thing is that caring, well-meaning friends tend to want to look after you and change your lifestyle. And I think you've got to make those decisions for yourself. I like the public property um, description because it's kind of pointing to the conceptual argument that I'm talking about. That the pulls, the pressures, the affective environments within which we uh, live and survive or not with cancer uh, are important. So, um, I guess, um, and I've tried to capture, you know, a, a number of points in the book, um, what I wanted to really um, convey today is that in both these examples and many others, um, that we're really talking about the rippling of emotions across social relations. Um, the person who is embarking on survival is in many respects um, the point of settlement of things. That doesn't mean they can't resist, it doesn't mean they can't be things and do things, it means that like, um, that kind of dialectic between agency and freedom. Um, and that the subject, in this case the patient, the survivor, uh, is one point or one nodal point in the economy, in the moral economy, 
rather than the origin or destination, which is kind of that dialectical relation. Um, I think that this notion of suffering as estrangement is also very useful. Um, and actually Steinberg um, has written a really good paper on this, um, and I can't really cover all this detail today because of time. You know, she talks about um, the bad patient, she who might not be interested in marching forward or be able to do so, who might not be invested in life at any cost or perhaps even at all, she who is not brave. That's reflecting this kind of relational pull towards survival and the virtues of the qualities that the sociality of survivorship requires of its subjects. Um, and I, and I, I think that one of the, the really important points that kind of ties everything together is that I'm not arguing that the individual does not matter. Um, and I'm not dismissing the agency or the capacity of the person to make choices. I'm saying that we are all operating um, within and between things um, and that we need to take those into account and help professionals and family members and carers are in turn both operating within those um, environments but also holding them up. Is a conclusion. Tentative, as it always is, for a sociologist. Um, the main points, um, I guess, if I, I sort of um, struggle to capture um, the entirety of the arguments in, in, in a 40 minute um, or so presentation, um, but I have done my best, and apologies for um, going too fast over some of the slides, is that conceptually, and I guess I'm working with suffering beyond the biophysical in, in many respects today. Uh, I'm certainly working with suffering in the oncological context specifically, um, that it actually moves and lies across people. Um, and this notion of um, entanglement, um, but also the normativity of the atmospheres which surround us um, need greater attention, but also how we are all inadvertently complicit in holding those up. Um, and I think that, I know I'm creating some kind of dialectics here, but this notion of it settles on us but is also unsettled by us captures the potential agency that we may have in that context. Um, and I, I think that, that was the last slide, which seems personal. Um, so kind of what I gleaned from your talk is that you're looking at these relationships and I, I, I wasn't able to glean really what it is that you're, uh, what your aim is in so far as encouraging care professionals, for example, to relate empathically with patients without running the risk of tripping up ethically um, in decision making and so. Yeah, well I, th I suppose empathy um, would be a one way model or linear model of, of care. So um, that suggests that the suffering purely lies within the person, the patient, rather than thinking about how I am experiencing what is going on and how my clinical decisions, my relationships with other, like, I mean, if we saw what the nurses were handed by a lot of the oncologists, you can see how not questioning what is going on for me as a clinician will have implications both for other clinicians but also for patients in terms of what they may or may not be asked to do, be offered and so forth. So I think that the model of empathy or compassion, which is exactly why I have an issue with uh, this kind of psychosocial um, uh, linear um, sort of gift and exchange models of uh, relating to 
the cancer patient because the whole thing is based on the emotions, difficult emotions largely lie um, with the person who is suffering, who has cancer or who is dying, um, rather than um, the person who is caring having difficult emotions in relation to that person. Do you think that nurses are more readily available to grapple with these issues because they're not the primary decision makers and that might be why clinicians or surgeons that look happy are having a harder time they need to dissociate because mm. you know the, the, the consequences are they made the decision mm -hmm. so they have to deal with the repercussions. Mm. Well I think that would assume that the, the um, physician or the surgeon was actually making the decision. Um, whereas actually the decision was often made in conversation with the nurses anyway. Um, so there's the backstage and the front stage of decision making, right? Um, actually in many cases, uh, often it's the junior doctors that have the difficult conversations. And, and so, so on the one hand I agree with what you're saying that um, traditionally there's been a perception that nurses have more time to have informal, or perhaps the informal as part of the formal work, um, uh, conversations, interactions, and more intimate um, relations with patients and families. So in that case, one could argue that yes, they are more privy to um, emotions at work. However, I think that's problematic for both nursing and medicine because what that does is create this emotional division of labour where the excusing factor for doctors is that the emotions will be bracketed off and dealt with by the nurse and the nurse or nurses potentially utilise it as a form of capital but that's what we do well. What that does is create this erroneous distinction that emotions don't operate in that environment and in that context of that decision but they are all dealt with over here by the nursing staff. It's that very separation of feelings from action and decisions that I believe creates um, a lot of suffering, particularly in relation to um, people not being allowed to or feeling allowed to give up, to accept futility, to shift to palliative and supportive care only. Um, and uh, so it's a very long answer to, to your question, but uh, because I think it's a personal question. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. It's so interesting. I think the matter is not an official. And a couple of things I just wanted. In nursing, I think we really do often use the term bearing witness to another mm. suffering, which mm. I quite like. But I don't think in any way, I was curious about your statement, but I don't think in any way it doesn't infer that the bearing witness brings with it a lot of suffering. So I think that's really kind of key. Mm. I think it's a really important way to nurses. But like one or two things I just want yes. to ask, if I may. And yes. one is, like in some of the quotes where the physicians, some of them, Ray kind of brought a different perspective from one of the others, talked about, didn't use the word distancing, but that's what he, I think, was talking about, and yeah. keeping it very factual. I mean, do you, I don't, I'm not convinced that we can make those kinds of choices. Hmm. Um, and, and I'm wondering what you think about that as an actual choice. Yep. You seem to be claiming it was a choice you made. I wish I had that much control over my feet. I know I personally <laughs> don't. Um, and the final thing I just wanted to ask, something I've been reading quite a bit about very recently, is the notion of intergenerational trauma. Yep. And I'm wondering what you think about intergenerational suffering as a form of trauma. So thank you. Um, so that's uh, the three very interesting questions. The, the Sorry, I should never ask the three in one question. I love it. You're talking to a sociologist. We love three tech questions. I mean, you know, rarely do we actually ask questions. We just make statements. Um, so I guess bearing witness uh, has distinctly religious undertones, isn't it? It does, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe, the, but maybe maybe that's my sociological baggage that uh, finds that a little bit uh, um, uh, problematic. Or, um, but yes, I I don't think I think you're right. That notion um, captures a slightly biblical 
uh, being with the person in suffering. Um, and I think it's getting more at, albeit with baggage, um, what what we're talking about here. So I, I think that, you know, um, language is important, you know. It's what carries things. Language carries, um, you know, a whole series of political, cultural kind of assumptions about uh, how we should be. Um, distancing, uh, I, I think that this is part of the reason why I find the psychosocial concept so difficult is because they suggest we can make choices about how we um, feel about things. And I think we can make choices about um, how we express how we feel, but I don't think we can make choices about how we actually feel. Um, you know, and there's a gender dynamic to that as well. Um, so I think these notions of distancing, I mean, there are complexities here, aren't there? Because there's also personality types. So, you know, we can say, oh, you know, this person has been in oncology for 15, 20 years and they just burnt out. Alternatively, from day one, they could have been quite a dissociated person. You know, and I'm not saying that people are, you know, kind of um, born to be particular ways. I'm not being essentialist about it. But I am saying where there is high diversity um, within any profession. And we do need to account for um, dispositional differences and expressive differences. It is also true that in medicine um, that um, this, I'm getting into a bit of a stereotype here. I'm digging myself a stereotype hole. Um, that type A personalities, uh, certain dispositions do quite well because of the nature of um, the, what's required of its subjects. Um, so that's also going to shape, uh, uh, you know, who's drawn into those particular environments and what they contribute to it. So, you know, and, and far be it for me to talk about the history of nursing and, and what it means and how it's performed. But emotions as a form of capital versus emotions as a barrier to providing your professional skill is an important part of what we're talking about here. So, um, but to get back to what you said, I totally agree with you. Um, distancing is, is virtually impossible. We just did a study in Australia of the entire medical oncology workforce. Um, and um, so it was qualitative and, and survey based. And, you know, one of the things we talked some about is, you know, um, burnout and, and um, from a more sociological perspective, um, how they're managing um, this process. No one, no one really talked about distancing or, or um, they, they talked about it in terms of um, sustainability, that I can't give the care to the patient that I need to be able to give. So I think the more positive take on it is that actually, because it can get a bit negative with these things, positive take on it, people actually do want to acknowledge and engage in what's going on in an encounter, um, but aren't necessarily given the skills to do that. And I think, you know, we do need to remember that. Your third question about intergenerational trauma might take me another hour. Okay. Uh, or intergenerational suffering. I think it's absolutely fascinating because it's about sort of a um, it, it it conjures up, um, and I mean that you know literally and metaphorically. I suppose it's the the specter of what has been. Um, it's how suffering ripples through families, how it carries on, how if we look at childhood. And if we're talking about these same very things that I said at the start of the talk, about the effective assemblage of a childhood, is if we can talk about that, that we take that with us, but it, it merges with other things. Um, so how can we say that, and, and this gets really complicated in terms of what is the meaning of cancer and illness and affliction and, and so forth, and we can really... I mean, I don't know how many holes I could dig myself in this answer, but, you know, to what extent is affliction itself a biophysical, spiritual, social, whatever articulation of uh, intergenerational trauma? And I think there are, I think in psychoanalytic circles, that's a 
that's quite a readily asked question. And I don't think we should be scared of asking. It doesn't mean there aren't illness is not multifactorial. Or maybe that is part of um, the emergence of illness as well. Um, that's a more, I guess, uh, um, a reflection which, you know, is off the cuff but interesting. Um, I know that there's probably lots of other questions, but the good news is that Alex is going to be at the edge tomorrow, and I'm sure you're all coming. Tomorrow. I don't even know what that means. Does that mean I'm going to be like really, really jet lagged yeah. and like ready to and, and out and available to chat, especially around intermission? Um, so anyway, so uh, and, and Alex is with us for the rest of the week, so don't hesitate to shoot an email if you've got some follow-up questions, and we'll post this, uh, this little presentation as well. So um, just join me in thanking Alex for. Thank you.